Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our last University of Toronto SRI seminar of the 2022-23 academic year. For those new to the seminar series, my name is Sheila McElraith. I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, a Canada CIFAR AI chair at the Vector Institute, and also an associate director here at the schwartz riesman Institute for Technology and Society. Since this is our last seminar, I wanted to add that I've greatly enjoyed conceiving and organizing this year's seminar series and creating, thanks to, in no small part to all of you, um, an environment for engaging and thought-provoking discussion. I also want to acknowledge the contributions of the SRI team that works behind the scenes to make the seminar series run so smoothly. A huge thanks to all of you who are, are on this call today. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. I'll be handing over the reins to some of my SRI academic colleagues for the next year, but I, we welcome your feedback on how to make the series one that services our local and international SRI community as effectively as possible. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Before we begin today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. These and other indigenous peoples across Turtle Island developed complex and effective governance systems based on respect for all life and the intelligence of the natural world. Today, this land is still home to many indigenous people working to reclaim their rights to self-determination, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we may all be joining from different places, we invite you to reflect on the history and the relations of the land that you are on. A few logistics um, uh, items before we begin. This session, of course, is being recorded as all of our sessions are recorded and, and, and we do post our, our um, seminars online for those of you who may have missed some in the past. Sven will be speaking for about 50 minutes and he'll take questions after his talk, but he did mention that if there's something that, that, that someone wants clarified, um, something short during, during his, his talk, he is open to, to clarifying, quick clarifying questions. Um, during the question and answer period afterwards, please do raise your hands, use the raise hand function on Zoom to indicate that you have a question. Or if you don't have a working microphone, please uh, post your question in the chat and, and we'll, um, we will uh, field it for you. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Sven Nyholm. Sven is Professor of Ethics of Artificial Intelligence at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Until recently, Sven was an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Utrecht University. He's a member of the Ethics Advisory Board of the Human Brain Project, one of the world's largest neuroscience projects, and an, also an editor, Associate Editor of Science and Engineering Ethics. Sven has published on a wide range of topics within ethical theory, and the philosophy of technology, spanning from the history of ethical thought to recent challenges raised by technologies such as artificial intelligence, robots, and self-driving cars. His publications include Humans and Robots, Ethics, Agency, and Anthropomorphism, and also This is Technology Ethics, an Introduction. Uh, and without further ado, Sven, the floor is now yours. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, really great to be here. So uh, I'm going to see if I get my, can get my slides up and running. So I think you should hopefully be seeing them now. Uh, yeah, so uh, AI responsibility gaps and asymmetries between praise and blame. Uh, I mean, I think the, the first uh, expression there, AI should be clear to everyone, but the other ones I'm going to be uh, hopefully clarifying as I speak, because I think there's some... Uh, interesting uh, issues when it comes to uh, worries that one might have about people losing responsibility for what AI systems do in different ways when it comes to uh, good outcomes that may be produced by AI systems versus bad outcomes that may be produced by AI systems. But we'll get there. And, but before we do, I want to start by actually going back in time just a little bit to March of 2016. And I think Perhaps a lot of people in this audience will recognize this man here. Uh, if you don't, it's Lee Seidel. Uh, he, I think he may be possibly still is, I don't know, but at, at the very least at that point in time, he was the world champion uh, of the game of Go. Uh, and, uh, or let's say the human world champion of the game of Go. Famously, 
Uh, he then played as many as, let's see if I can get my slides too. There we go, as, as many as five games against the AlphaGo uh, computer program that was developed by DeepMind. And so uh, in preparation for these five games, uh, I mean, I, I guess Lisa Dahl had been practicing all his life, but uh, AlphaGo was trained on uh, thousands of Go games that humans had played and AlphaGo also played millions of games against itself and thereby developed all sorts of strategies. I mean, I, I don't know anything about Go myself, but I did speak with a colleague who does play Go and who, who told me that uh, some of the moves that AlphaGo recommended uh, were actually sort of unexpected and seemed like uh, even rook, rookie mistakes. And people thought, okay, well, Lee Sedol is gonna win, no problem. And actually he did win one of the four, five games. However, he did lose the other four games because some of those unexpected moves turned out to be brilliant moves and uh, well, brilliant enough that uh, yeah, the, the world champion, Lee Sedol lost. And uh, one interesting thing is that, of course, this was a computer program and not a robot. And so there had to be a human being, the gentleman there on the left, who had to move around the stones on the Go board. Now, uh, he, uh, the, the, the person on the left, he could never have uh, you know, beat, uh, beaten Lee Sedol in, in a Go game because uh, you know, obviously Lee Sedol was the world champion and he just kind of followed the instructions from uh, AlphaGo. Now, what, so he, he it's clear that Lee Sedol was the loser of those uh, four other games, uh, but clearly the, the person sitting on the very left was not the winner. He just, uh, you know, carried out the move on, uh, as recommended by AlphaGo. Now, what about Google DeepMind? Uh, are they the winners of this game? Well, I mean, you could say that they didn't play those thousands of Go games against uh, you know, that, that uh, the, the, the AlphaGo had been trained on. They also didn't play those millions of Go games that uh, AlphaGo played against itself in order to prepare for the, the match. And presumably none of the DeepMind engineers could have won this game. So uh, while it's clear that there's a loser here, so Lisa Dole, it may be that there's no obvious winner, unless you think that, you know, it, of what, in a certain sense, AlphaGo won the games. But is AlphaGo praiseworthy in the way that a human would have been if he or she had won these games against Elisa Dahl? Perhaps there is a sort of gap here in terms of who, who is a praiseworthy winner, but there is a clear loser, namely Elisa Dahl. Now, jumping ahead about ex pretty much exactly two years into the future of March of uh, 2018, we have another case where there's a clear loser the human being, uh, Elaine Hertzberg, who was then hit and killed uh, by a self-driving car, an experimental Uber car uh, in Tempe, Arizona. I'm sure people are also familiar with this case. And that was the first time that a human being uh, outside of a self-driving car, and people had uh, died in experimental or other self-driving cars uh, uh, in the, sitting in the driver's seat, so to speak. But this was the first time that someone was hit and killed. And in a certain sense, uh, here, uh, well, there was also a human involved, namely the safety driver. So this lady here on the left, uh, she did not uh, have time to react in time. And so she was only able to sort of look in horror as, as what happened. Uh, there's a video of this that is quite gruesome. I don't know if people have seen it. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't exactly recommend it. It's, it's very interesting, but uh, she was not. Uh, she was looking away at, for for just a moment, and then she looked up and she noticed that this person, Elaine Hertzberg, was crossing the street, and it was too late. Now the AI in the car also didn't properly recognize Hertzberg as a human person that she, if, and uh, apply the brakes. Uh, apparently, the system in the car kind of jumped back and forth between road sign, unknown item, bicycle, uh, and instead of taking appropriate action, it sort of tried to decide what exactly was in its path and reacted too late and the self-driving car hit and killed Elaine Hertzberg. Now, again, there's a clear human loser, in this case, the person who was injured and ultimately died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Uh, but uh, here too, you might say, well, he, who exactly is responsible? After uh, this happened, uh, the, the lady who was the safety driver was uh, blamed by some people. Others said that, well, it wasn't her fault. 
the people in, uh, behind this whole experiment also said that well they followed all the rules and laws in Arizona so they they took all the sorts of precautions that uh, could be expected of them so it wasn't their fault again you might ask well should we perhaps blame the self-driving car uh, if you think that that makes sense then perhaps but most people would say that that doesn't make sense and so here there might be another kind of gap in terms of uh, who we should think is responsible for this uh, outcome in this case a bad outcome and so these kinds of cases are discussed under the general heading of responsibility gaps uh, there's also something called the campaign to stop killer robots and uh, well, you can go to their website, you see there in the picture, stopkillerrobots.org. And they offer arguments for why we should not have autonomous weapons systems. That's what they mean by this phrase, killer robots. And one of the arguments is exactly that uh, as we hand over, well, warfare basically to autonomous weapons systems or what they call killer robots, there might uh, appear gaps in accountability is what they are mostly concerned with. Uh, who should we hold accountable or otherwise blame or perhaps punish if uh, something happens that shouldn't happen in a wartime situation. And these gaps in responsibility are, according to the members of this campaign, serious enough that we should stop uh, the development of autonomous uh, weapons uh, for uh, warfare. So uh, there are all sorts of possible gaps that can arise with respect to responsibility. and. Uh, I spoke you know, about a few different examples here, but I'm going to try to classify different possible forms of gaps and responsibility into four broad kinds. And then I'm going to relate that uh, to uh, actually very long discussion in, in philosophy. So I'm, I'm personally coming from the field of philosophy uh, of people arguing, of philosophers arguing that there are certain asymmetries between the good, uh, you know, doing things for which we're praiseworthy on the one hand, and the bad doing things for which we are blameworthy uh, on the other. Uh, and I'm gonna discuss that both in terms of the motivations and incentives that people have to do good uh, or avoid the bad on the one hand, or take responsibility for their actions. And then also in terms of what people actually uh, deserve. Uh, so uh, I think there are also interesting asymmetries between people's motivations and maybe what they deserve and what they don't deserve that I'll also get to. So in general, then, I want to say that there are different kinds of gaps that we should be worried about. And uh, it's interesting to think about this when we think about how, how the, uh, our criteria for when people are blameworthy and praiseworthy are a little bit different. And that may create further asymmetries when it comes to this gaps in responsibility that are, are related to AI. So yeah, uh, as I said before, I'm going to explain a lot of these uh, key terms here, and hopefully uh, it's going to be uh, clear what I'm talking about as I'm going along. Now, I should perhaps start with this phrase, asymmetries between the good and the bad, since that may be the least uh, clear of this uh, technical uh, piece of jargon that I'm, I'm, I'm using here. And as I said, there's really a long history uh, in philosophy of philosophers, uh, very well-known ones, arguing that there are certain asymmetries between what's good and what's bad. Uh, I mean, if you go back to uh, you know, the ancient Greeks and uh, people in, in, around that time, you know, uh, Plato, uh, for example, and then also a little bit later, Augustine, they talk about different versions of what uh, is sometimes called the problem of evil. Uh, so Plato claimed that everything in the world springs out of goodness. The, the form of the good was the terminology of Plato. The idea of the good is the source of everything. Then the question arises, well, how come that there are bad and evil things in the world if goodness is somehow the ultimate source of everything? Uh, St. Augustine, he talked not about the, the, the good, but God as being the source of everything. And God was, uh, of course, considered to be good in uh, Augustine's type of Christianity. There too, there's a problem of evil. If God is good and created everything, how come that there are evil things in the world, people and, and uh, bad and evil things happening? Well, their response was that actually the good and, and the bad are very asymmetrical. The good is some a positive, real presence uh, with a substantive nature, whereas the evil or the bad is an absence of the good. And so it could be, they argued, that there could be evil in the world because there could be some parts of the world where there's an absence of the good. So the e bad or evil 
uh, doesn't have a positive nature in the sense that goodness has. So that, that's just one very early uh, example of this idea that there's a kind of difference between the good and the bad. Uh, so jumping ahead quite a bit in, in the history of philosophy to the, uh, you know, the early modern era, uh, we get uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, who some of you may have heard of. He actually claims something a little bit similar. So he says, uh, talking about uh, the good person or the just man, I mean, uh, he, that, that, that's what uh, was the, the terminology that he used. He says, the just man is he who taketh care that all of his actions are just or good. The unjust man or person, I would rather say, uh, is a person who doesn't take care that all of their actions are just or good. So there's also an asymmetry there, according to Hobbes. So Hobbes claims that the, the just person or the good person tries to always be just or good, whereas people who are not just, um, well, Hobbes would say that the person who does that sort of thing is someone who doesn't take care that uh, they try to be just and good in their behavior. Uh, that is, according to Hobbes, what uh, accounts for a sort of bad behavior, failure to control oneself. Uh, and uh, jumping ahead quite a bit to a much more recent book by Philip Pettit, who uh, is a philosopher from uh, that may uh, work in Princeton that may be familiar to some of you. He wrote a whole book about what he calls the robust demands of the good. So he thinks that being good requires much like what Hobbes said, that you try to do good consistently, uh, not just when it's convenient to you or not just when you feel like it, but also on those occasions when it's inconvenient to you and when you don't feel like it. Uh, whereas being a person who is not good, a bad person, uh, is to not, again, to not control yourself. Uh, to, if you have an impulse to do something immature like uh, a Zoom bomber might do, then it's a failure uh, to control to try to do good. Uh, so that's another kind of asymmetry from the history of philosophy. Uh, jumping ahead again uh, to Susan Wolf, uh, as philosopher at, uh, at Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. Uh, she argues that there's another asymmetry between the good and the bad. Uh, in her case, she thinks that uh, if you're someone who's psychologically determined to do bad things, uh, then you're not actually responsible for your behavior. Uh, if there's something wrong with you, so to speak, and you just can't help yourself by doing bad things, then we, we shouldn't blame you. However, she thinks, if you are psychologically determined to do good, if you can't help yourself but being responsive uh, to good reasons for good behavior, then you might be responsible and praiseworthy for your behavior. Uh, there's an underlying uh, argument that she makes for why that is the case. Is, uh, to be responsible requires that you have the ability to understand what is good and to understand good reasons for and against doing things and to be able to be moved by that capacity. Now, it could be that you're so strongly influenced by this capacity that you just can't help by doing good. But it could also be that you do have the capacity, but you fail to exercise it. So that's how you can still be responsible for bad things you might, might do if you have that capacity. But if it should turn out that you are compelled to just do bad things because you're, you have a failure to sort of uh, to respond to the good, then you're not responsible. So uh, yet another uh, asymmetry is discussed by Shauna Schifrin. Uh, so Shauna Schifrin is a philosopher at UCLA. Uh, Others have also discussed this idea, such as the philosopher Kant, uh, that you might be familiar to, or Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. They think that the good is quite demanding, uh, especially if you agree with Hobbes and Pettit. You have to try to always be good in order to count as good. So therefore, the moral requirements to do good, I mean, everyone should do good, but uh, those requirements are less stringent and less demanding than the moral requirements to avoid doing bad things. Uh, and so... Of course, you should. It's nice if you're good, but uh, uh, typically we think that it's primarily if you have some special relationship, such as that between a, a parent and a child, perhaps a, a, a lawyer and their client, a doctor and their patient, that you have a positive duty to actually kind of go out and try to improve people's lives, the lives of your child, the life of your patient or, or your client, or something like that. However, uh, when it comes to avoiding doing bad things, harming people, that requirement applies even to the perfect stranger. You can't just go out and harm someone. So they say uh, doing good is quite hard and, and demanding. And so therefore, 
Uh, we should expect people to, you know, to try to be good, but we can't demand that they're good all the time, but we can demand that they, we don't go out and, and harm people and do bad things. So the, the relative strengths of these duties differ. Uh, okay, so jumping ahead to yet another so, uh, asymmetry between the good and bad. So Joshua Nob is a philosopher and a psychologist who has done a very large number of experiments that tend to show that people seem to have an intuition that if people do things that have bad side effects and they know about it, so they foresee that something that they're doing may cause harm to other people, then we tend to see that as intentionally harming those other people. And we tend to want to blame them for uh, their behavior. However, if we have people who do things on the other hand, where they, these people know that, well, that may be helpful for other people as a kind of side effect uh, and people intentionally act you know, with some other aim and then as a happy accident, good things happen to other people, then uh, most people don't see that as intentionally go doing good. It's, it's seen as a kind of accident and, and it's good, but it's not praiseworthy in the same sort of way. So allowing bad things to happen is seen as much more something that we're responsible for than allowing good things to happen. If we want to be responsible for good outcomes, it should be that we're actually trying and making efforts to produce those good things. Otherwise, it's seen as, again, a happy accident, but not something that we're actively doing. Okay, so one last asymmetry between the good and the bad. I'm just trying to bring home this idea that throughout the history of philosophy, like all sorts of philosophers have claimed that there are important differences between doing good and doing bad and being praiseworthy and blameworthy. So the last one uh, is, is going to take us back to AI and robots and uh, technologies, namely Robert Sparrow. He thinks that, and, and this is perhaps the strangest one of the asymmetries that I'll mention. He, he thinks that if you're sort of kicking robots that look like people or like look like dogs, you know, there was a famous video of people kicking spot the robot dog, then this may show that there's some problem with your uh, character. Uh, you know, you're somehow violent in your tendencies or something like that, and it may reflect poorly on you. On the contrary, according to Sparrow, if I'm nice to robots, if I go around petting robot dogs and I'm, uh, you know, trying to treat uh, AI systems well, then this doesn't show that I'm a virtuous person. That doesn't reflect well on me in the same way. So uh, according to Sparrow, you can be cruel in your interaction with robots and other technologies, but you can't really be kind. You can only be kind to people and to and animals that actually have real feelings. Uh, and so th there are two arguments that Sparrow gives for this. One argument is that to be good, you really need to have practical wisdom. You have to uh, have moral insight, whereas to be bad, you it can just be that you lack wisdom and practical insight. And the second argument is that in life in general, there are many ways of failing and doing things poorly but there are only a few things of getting things right. And that applies to virtue, uh, just as it applies to doing science or you know, all sorts of things you might do, baking cakes, uh, many ways of screwing it up when you bake a cake, uh, only a few ways of getting it right. Okay, so I wanna return later to this idea that the criteria for qualifying as doing good or being praiseworthy are quite different than the criteria uh, for qualifying as doing bad things and being blameworthy. Uh, so just, just let's put that idea aside for the moment and, and let's get back to it later. But let's first introduce the idea of gaps in responsibility. I already gave you a couple of examples in the beginning to just get, you know, give you a flavor for what I'm talking about. We hand over tasks to AI technologies, such as recommending moves in a game uh, or, you know, the, the, what we talk about a lot today are language models that, uh, you know, we, we want a text to be written and we maybe ask chat GPT, you know, write me a summary of the, the latest book by Susan Wolf or something like that. Uh, and so, or we have a self-driving car. And so we hand over the task of driving around uh, to the AI system in the car and so that we don't have to have a human driver anymore. Now, this whole idea of AI as technologies that can take over tasks that we need our human intelligence for, that very idea opens up worries about possible gaps in responsibility because those tasks that we give over to AI systems may be important tasks that we have responsibilities to perform in good and proper ways, taking care that people are not harmed, uh, showing talent, etc. Uh, and 
if we give over these tasks that we need our intelligence for, that are important responsibilities, to technologies that themselves perhaps cannot be responsible, well, the question arises then, well, who then exactly is responsible if, uh, if not the technology that took over the task? Uh, and of course, uh, sometimes, you know, maybe it's the programmers, maybe it's the developers of the software, or maybe it's the, the people building the self-driving car or whatever. But there's always this worry that as we have a technology rather than a human perform a certain task, well, we have to discuss the issue of have we actually created a kind of vacuum or a gap in responsibility? And I should say, I think we should think of this as a kind of gradual thing. And so uh, in a certain sense, you can say, well, either I am responsible for something or not, but we can also think that under certain circumstances, perhaps I'm less responsible than I would otherwise be. So let's say, so I have some uh, water here. So let's say that someone else had put some drugs into my water and I can't really control myself. Well, then perhaps I'm less responsible than if that hadn't happened. Uh, but I may still have some control over myself and so I'm not completely non-responsible for what happens. Or if I myself put drugs in my water, then perhaps I'm a little bit more responsible than if someone else had done it. But I may not be fully responsible because I've lost some of my self-control due to having taken this drug. So it seems to me that responsibility uh, can be weakened or it can go away totally because maybe I'm so knocked out by this drug that I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm totally irres not responsible for my actions uh, or I'm, I'm less responsible. So, so let's think of it as a kind of uh, a spectrum where on the one extreme end is that I'm not, not responsible, perhaps no one else is. And so there's a total gap in responsibility. And on the other spectrum, it's very clear who's responsible and they're fully responsible. And then, you know, as we move along the spectrum, there might be situations where maybe some people are responsible, but they're less responsible, less, less clearly responsible. There's a kind of weakening in the responsibility. And there might be more unclarity about who exactly is responsible. So when I talk about responsibility gaps here, I want to open either there might be the total gap we have no idea who's responsible or responsibility has been sort of diluted weakened uh and that may already be troublesome for some people okay so uh now when it comes to different types of gaps in responsibility or just different kinds of responsibility we can make distinctions between different kinds of cases uh and i'm going to try to create a kind of a matrix with different boxes. Uh, this is something that uh, philosophers like to do. I, I'm sure uh, some of the others uh, from other fields here today also like this kinds of thing. So the first distinction I want to make is between what I'm calling negative and positive responsibility. I just mean that if something bad has happened, someone has been har harmed, for example, and we want someone to blame, then that's a case of what I'm calling negative responsibility. If something good has happened, for example, a patient has been cured who had some problem and it's correctly diagnosed and a treatment has been suggested and we are looking for someone to praise this is a case of what i'm calling positive responsibility something good has happened and we're looking for someone to praise okay so that's the first distinction the second distinction is between what, what philosophers sometimes call backward and forward looking responsibility so let's say that something has happened in the past again someone was harmed or someone was cured let's say a problem then we might say okay who's responsible for this good thing that already happened in the past but we may also look into the future and say, well, you know, next year, uh, unless we take certain forms of actions, there might be certain problems. Who is responsible for making sure that we can avoid these problems? That's a kind of forward looking responsibility uh, or something good might happen. You know, next, if we, if we play our cards correctly, then next year, you know, some really good outcome will be achieved. Who is responsible for making sure that we bring about this good outcome? That's also a question about forward-looking responsibilities so of course if you have these two distinctions you can make uh, distinctions between responsibilities that are negative and backward looking something bad has happened and we're asking basically who to blame or something good has happened and we're asking who should we praise and recognize for this good outcome or we can look into the future and see there's a risk of something bad happen happening whose responsibility is it to try to avoid the bad outcome or to prevent it or something good could happen and we're looking into the future asking, well, is anyone here responsible for making sure that the good outcome is achieved? I mean, when it comes to these kinds of forward-looking positive responsibilities, 
uh, some of the examples that I mentioned before, for example, being a parent, uh, we as parents, we may feel that we have a positive responsibility to try to make sure that uh, things go well for our children in the future. And so we are willing to take on that forward looking positive responsibility and try to raise our children well. Uh, the less we have a personal relationship to someone, the less we may feel that why is it my responsibility to try to make things go well for these strangers? Uh, I might feel that I'm only responsible for people towards whom I have some sort of special responsibility. Now, if you have this chart of four kinds of responsibilities, you can basically just add the word gap to the chart and you get four kinds of possible gaps in responsibility. So uh, it could be that something has happened in the past, it's bad, and we're looking for someone to blame, but we can't find anyone. So there's a backward looking gap in responsibility or something good has happened and we're looking around for someone to, to praise for this, but we can't find anyone who's sort of worthy of being praised and recognized for the good outcome. Again, looking for, forward, you can see that there's a risk of something bad happening, but no one feels responsible, no one is responsible, so there might be a forward-looking negative responsibility gap, or there's something positive that could happen in the future, but we just can't find anyone to, uh, of whom we can say that, yeah, it's his or her or their responsibility to bring about the good outcome. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, this, well, there we go. This, the terminology I'm, I'm used, backward looking, negative, forward looking, negative, et cetera, different kinds of responsibility gaps. Uh, and I want to suggest that when we think about AI and technology, there might actually be created all kinds of these responsibility gaps because we're handing over tasks that were previously human responsibilities to technologies, and this can create a lack, uh, sort of these unclarities of responsibility. So just real quick, uh, in the literature, when people talk about responsibility gaps, it's typically the backward looking negative kind. I mean, I showed this picture of the, uh, the this campaign to stop killer robots. There's an article by Robert Sparrow from 2007, one of the most cited articles on this topic. That article and most articles are about this kind of backward looking, you know, something bad has happened, who should we blame type of responsibility. But um, I myself, together with uh, John Danaher, we have a article where we argue that actually in, in the future, if there are more and more things that have been taken over by AI systems, there might be all sorts of good outcomes. Patients being uh, given the right treatment, good texts being written, uh, good work being uh, carried out, but it's all done by AI and robots. And so there's really no one who can sort of claim full credit uh, for some of these outcomes. And then there might be what we call gaps in achievement, achievement gaps. That's a kind of backward looking uh, something good has happened, but no humans responsible type of responsibility gap. Uh, I myself, in one of those books that uh, Sheila mentioned in the introduction, talk about what I call obligation gaps. And so, uh, you know, if, if we hand over the task of driving safely to a self-driving car and, uh, you know, it has a, you know, a human would have had an obligation to not hit people. But if you think that self-driving cars don't really have obligations, there might be a kind of gap in terms of whose responsibility it is to avoid a crash. Uh, I mean, you, you can discuss this obviously, but that, that's the sort of thing that you may worry about. Uh, uh, colleagues of mine, Santoni de Sio and Makachi, they have also discussed the same thing under the heading of what they call active responsibility gaps. It's, it's pretty much the same idea. Now, uh, the last box there is the one that really hasn't been discussed a lot in the literature uh, because people usually don't use this you know, these boxes of types of responsibility gaps. I think that, you know, what is called AI alignment may be an example of this. Uh, as I said, uh, we typically feel responsible for doing good for other people, primarily when we have special relationships to people. But a lot of the tech companies creating AI don't have special relationships to the people, you know, out in the, in, in the, in the world, so to speak. And so even though it would be nice of them if they align AI nicely with human values so that we have good rather than bad outcomes, they may say that, yeah, if we do it again, it's, it's sort of, we're going beyond the call of duty because, you know, we only have positive responsibilities to our friends and families and things like that. Anyway, so that's uh, uh, a type of the box that has been discussed the, the least in, in my little matrix here. Okay. Now, uh, one question you might say is, okay, we have possible gaps in responsibility, but do we need to mind the gaps? Are they bad? Uh, and actually, it turns out that in the literature, people have very different opinions about this. 
I mentioned John Danaher before, uh, my uh, friend and colleague. He actually has a paper that came out last year where he says that, well, you know, sometimes being responsible is really burdensome. Uh, we have to make all sorts of choices and people are always holding us responsible for things. It might be nice to be, to be able to hand over some responsibilities to technologies so that we don't always have to be responsible for everything. Uh, I mean, he t talks about tragic choices. I mean, so let's say that we have another, another pandemic and we have to make decisions about, you know, who gets, uh, you know, treatment or not. Perhaps, you know, it would be nice if an algorithm did so we so people didn't have to take responsibility for all of those tragic decisions. Uh, Simpson and Muller, uh, they argue that, well, it's not exactly nice to have responsibility gaps, but if the overall outcomes of having the technologies, let's say military robots or self-driving cars are good enough, then perhaps if there are certain cases where we don't know who's responsible, then we can tolerate that because uh, maybe having self-driving cars saves a lot of lives, maybe having killer robots or military robots rather than human soldiers spares our you know, human soldiers' lives, et cetera. So maybe we should tolerate uh, gaps in responsibility. On the other extreme, uh, we have one of my colleagues at LMU Munich, Christian List, who argues that we shouldn't ever introduce a technology that creates a responsibility gap. We should always be clear on who's responsible before we introduce some new form of AI or other technology, because he thinks, and actually a lot of people along with him, uh, such as the, the, the campaign to stop killer robots, that gaps in responsibility are, as I here uh, translate his view, to intolerable. Uh, now, I think that uh, perhaps uh, whether we're talking about what, what I'm calling negative or positive responsibility gaps, there might be a, a difference in the tolerability. So uh, Danaher's idea that actually sometimes it's nice not to be responsible for things, that might work better when it comes to negative responsibility because it could be nice not to have to be blamed. But if something good happens, then we tend to want to say, well, maybe I you know, had something to do with it and we want to be recognized and, and praised. But if there are gaps in responsibility, perhaps there's not opportunity for, and no opportunity for us to receive that recognition. So it may depend a little bit on whether it's good or, or, or negative responsibility when we, we ask, you know, how should we mind these gaps? And here we get to these uh, issues about uh, asymmetries that I want to talk about. And the first type of asymmetry is, well, well, we could solve responsibility gaps by just having people volunteer themselves and say, okay, I take responsibility. Actually, when it comes to self-driving cars, some companies such as Audi and Volvo have said that when they will have self-driving cars, they will take responsibility for what happens. Uh, so maybe this is the way to go. We should solve problems with responsibility by just looking around to see, well, who's willing to take responsibility? I think here, however, that there are asymmetries in, in the incentives that people may have. Now, if something good has happened, then obviously a lot of people are going to be volunteering uh, because there are going to be strong incentives to do so, to say, well, I did it. It was me. Please, you know, please recognize me for the good I did and for the part that I played or whatever. However, if something bad happens, then people are going to be looking around and say, well, you know, it wasn't me. I, maybe it was him or her or them, or maybe it was the machine's fault. So uh, why is that? Well, being blamed or punished even for bad outcomes, that can be quite you know, bad for you. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's not very nice and, you, you know, your social status might go down, etc. So it's quite costly. However, if something good has happened and you're praised for it, that's very good for you. So the strong incentives to try to say that you're positively responsible for things, strong incentives to try to deny blame for bad things that happen. So solving responsibility gaps by expecting people to take responsibility, it's going to work so much better when it comes to good things that have happened than bad things that have happened. Now, however, when it comes to good things that have yet to happen, their people's motivation is going to be quite different than for good things that have already happened. Because if a good thing has happened in the past, a patient has been cured, some good outcome has been achieved, then there's no work to do. It's already there. The only thing you have to do is to take responsibility. However, if some good outcome is yet to be achieved, you, you, you may need to do some work. You may need to put yourself on the line, so to speak, and you may you know, lose out on other opportunities to, produce, to, you know, to pursue your narrow self-interest. And so the incentives are going to be quite different. And as I said before, we typically only accept responsibility to, to do good if we feel that we have a special relationship such as that with our children or with our 
you know, clients or with our uh, patients, whatever, or maybe with our students, if we're teachers, as many of us here are. So again, the incentives uh, for taking responsibility for things that have or will happen are going to be quite different. And it's primarily good things that have already happened that are going to have attract a lot of volunteers to fill responsibility gaps. So that's a one type of uh, asymmetry to take into account. Uh, just really quick, I mean, people are willing to try to avoid having bad things happen uh, because they worry that they will be blamed later. Uh, of course, they if they think that they can uh, do something now to be praised later, that might be some motivation, but we tend to dislike being blamed more than we uh, you know, like making the efforts that would give us praise later. So, okay, what about deserving to be praised or blamed? So I was just talking just now about whether someone would be willing to uh, ex you know, accept blame or be willing to put themselves forward as being praiseworthy. And I said that there were asymmetries in people's incentives and motivations. Uh, when do we deserve praise or blame? And how does that relate to these gaps in responsibility? Here's where I want to get back to some of those traditional ideas from philosophy that I talked about at the very beginning. Well, uh, I said that Joshua Nob uh, has shown quite convincingly in a, lo a long series of uh, these uh, social psychology experiments that he's done uh, that people tend to think that other people who allow bad side effects to happen as a result of their actions, those people are blameworthy. They, they knowingly allow those bad things to happen. So it's their fault, so to speak. But if people you know, do things and they see that, okay, there could be good side effects for other people, and, and let's say that the good side effects are actually coming about, um, then we don't see other people as well. Okay, it was, it was all they're doing. It's more like a happy accident. Now, why is that? Well, it's because we have this idea, uh, perhaps going back to what uh, Pettit and uh, Hobbes and others argued for that I, I mentioned in the, fa in, in the beginning, that you know, to, to really count as doing good, you really have to kind of make an effort to try to consistently be good. Uh, if you only do good or allow good things to happen when it's convenient to you, you know, when, when that's going to happen anyway, you, do, you didn't really put in the effort to be expected of a truly good person. However, when it comes to being bad and being blameworthy, then being negligent and not trying to control for you know doing good might be enough. Uh, and that was the whole idea from uh, you know Hobbes who said that for example that the, you know the just man is is the person who tries to always be good and just, whereas the the unjust person is the person who doesn't you know consistently try to be just or good. The idea again is that to really qualify as doing something good, you really have to put your effort in, your talents, uh, your you know your heart and soul, so to speak. And uh, actually, this is uh, described nicely in an article by Hannah Maslin and colleagues. They say that to count as really doing something good in a praiseworthy way, you have to one, put in some effort, uh, two, uh, potentially actually make some sort of sacrifice. It, it should be to some extent costly for you. And, and three, there should be some sort of talent or you have to show that you've really done the work, so to speak. Only then do you by common criteria truly count as doing something good. Um, I mean, we can also mention Susan Wolf, who I mentioned, uh, the philosopher who says that to be praiseworthy, you know, you have to have the ability to recognize what's good and to be kind of guided by your recognition of what, what's good uh, in order to truly count as being praiseworthy. I think that these kind of quite stringent requirements that people put on counting as doing good and being praiseworthy uh, and the difference between them and the requirements that are enough for you to count as being doing something bad and being blameworthy, make it the case that it's actually much easier to feel what I'm uh, to deserve blame for bad outcomes created by AI and technology than it is to deserve praise. Uh, why is that? Again, if you, I mean, people who create AI technologies that typically don't aim for bad outcomes. It's rather often that they are aware that those outcomes could happen and that they allow them to happen as a kind of side effect of what they're really trying to achieve. Uh, but we saw that it's, it's very common uh, when it comes to the criteria for being blameworthy that if we knowingly allow bad outcomes to be produced, then we quite often can be blameworthy for those bad outcomes. Uh, we may not take enough care to make sure that we are consistently doing good, so to speak, to, to use that language from Pettit and Hobbes. However, 
to really deserve praise for good outcomes, perhaps good outcomes created by AI or by yourself, it has to be that you are showing that you have a robust disposition to do good. But if I'm handed over the production of the good outcome to a technology rather than myself producing the outcome, then in what sense am I trying to robustly remain good in my actions? And what sacrifices and what efforts am I putting in uh, if the you know, I hand over the, t- the task, the technology, the technology produces the good outcome. Well, that just means that I need to put in lef- less effort. I need to show less talent. I need to uh, control my behavior. Uh, I don't need to control my behavior because, again, I've, I've handed over the task, the AI technology. Again, whereas doing bad, often it's enough that I kind of allow bad things to happen because I don't take proper care. And so if I hand over tasks to AI technologies, and I know that certain bad things could happen, I could be seen as allowing the bad and uh, be not uh, controlling it enough for, uh, for making sure that good effects occur. Now, that's pretty abstract. So let me give you an example. And so uh, when it comes to something like chat GPT, let's say that a student, in order to, you know, you, you are the teacher and you give the students an assignment. Let's say that you ask, you know, what would Aristotle say about AI ethics? And uh, the student realizes that actually that's the sort of thing that you could actually put into chat GPT. I mean, I try this myself. I asked chat GPT, not what Aristotle, but what Heidegger, another philo- philosopher would say about AI ethics. And actually, you know, chat GPT did a pretty decent job. Uh, so let's say that a student does that. They, instead of writing the paper themselves, they put in a prompt into chat GPT. They take the text, perhaps they edit it a little bit. They put their name on it and they present it to the teacher. The teacher, I think, would have good reasons for saying, you know, if I give you a good grade, that's a kind of praise. I say, I say that you did something well, that you did something good, that you showed talent, that you put in effort, that you show that you have a special skill. But actually, if you let ChatGPT write the paper for you, you don't do any of those things. You don't deserve the praise that is embodied in a good grade. However, if I am, let's say, a newspaper and I write my new stories partly by letting chat GPT write based on prompts that I feed in and I put my name on it well and this creates misinformation and people you know maybe behave in bad ways as a result of the misinformation that I'm spreading then here I'm allowing something bad to happen I know it could happen and so I might actually be living up to the uh, criteria that are to tend to be uh, applied to being blameworthy I'm not controlling sufficiently for making sure that my actions are all good i'm allowing bad outcomes and so here i think we're much more willing to say that i might deserve blame uh, for the spread of misinformation and actually be blameworthy while giving over this task to the ai system than the student in my first example would be praiseworthy for the good paper about aristotle and ai that might have been written uh, with the help of or by chat gpt so i think in general, the criteria for really counting as doing good and being praiseworthy, they're really hard to live up to. And so we have to do the work ourselves. We have to show talent. We have to show effort. We have to make sacrifices. And all of that makes it very hard to be praiseworthy if we hand over tasks that requires our talents, our efforts, etc., to AI systems. But the criteria for being blameworthy are different. They're, they, you know, we allow bad things to happen. We don't take proper care. We're, we're neglecting some of our responsibilities. And actually, by handing over tasks to to AI technologies that create bad outcomes, we may, in effect, live up to those criteria and we may possibly be blameworthy. So, to conclude, we should worry about gaps in responsibility, but not only gaps with respect to blame and badness, we should also worry about gaps of of the positive kind, uh, as I say, related to, you know, do we count as doing good? Uh, Are we worthy of recognition, etc.? Now, if we try to fill this gap by having volunteers, then people, yeah, they might be really willing to take responsibility for good outcomes uh, and much more so than for bad outcomes. But when it comes to deserving a praise and blame, it might be the other way around. It's actually easier to deserve blame when we hand over tasks to AI technologies and bad outcomes are produced than it is to deserve praise when we hand over uh, tasks to AI technologies and maybe good outcomes are Assume, uh, achieve because the, the, the criteria for praise and blame are asymmetric. Uh, it's more demanding to qualify as actually doing good. 
Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm very curious to see, well, here's just some of the things we talked about, but I already summarized what I wanted to say. So thanks again. And I'm very much looking forward to discussing this with you all. And I'm not gonna stop sharing my slides. Sven, thank you very much. That was a very interesting and provocative uh, discussion presentation. And I see we already have um, a question. So for those of you who are now transitioning to the, the question and answer session, we have until 4.30. Uh, so, so please um, raise your hands if you have questions and, and I will uh, identify you in, in order um, to, to pose your questions. And, and if you uh, don't, um, if you can't speak, then you can also enter something into the chat. So I think Steve Coyne is our first, uh, is at the top of the list. So Steve, please go ahead. Okay, we're good. So, um, great. So thanks for a really uh, interesting talk. This covered a lot of um, like obviously very relevant um, material. So it seemed to me that most of your kind of discussion applied to individual action. So action by, by a, a single agent. So in, that included a lot of the asymmetries you talked about. So like if my action had, if my individual action has bad side effects, then I get blame. But if my individual action has good side effects, maybe I get only a teeny amount of praise. So there's like an asymmetry there. But it seemed to me that there's another way of framing um, most, of your, most of your cases. And rather than thinking about them as individual action, you might think about them as kind of an interesting form of joint action or group action um, in consort with an artificial intelligence. So for instance, in the Uber case, we might think of uh, the Uber case as really two agents working on a problem together. Um, Uber is doing most of the driving and then the minder driver, the human driver, sort of gets a veto power over what Uber does, the, the Uber algorithm does. Same with your example of the, the student who's submitting the ChatGPT essay, you know, the, the, the students working in consort with ChatGPT, but they get kind of a veto and a right to modify it. So this leads, leads me to wonder um, whether we could kind of replicate a lot of what you're saying in terms of principles that apply to um, kind of the distribution of responsibility among um, joint agents or group agents. So for, for instance, here's one principle that you might think does apply to group agents. So suppose we have two agents working together um, and they're sort of working in a way where the contribution of the second one just is to give a veto to the first person's work. And that's their only contribution. It seems sort of inevitable in that case that even though we're talking about two people here, you know, the second person, the person who only has the power of veto is only ever going to be eligible for blame. They're not really going to get a lot of praise out of the deal. So I guess I'm wondering how much of the, of, of your analysis is kind of distinctively, like how much of, of your analysis kind of hinges distinctively on the features of artificial intelligence versus how much do you think might instead hinge on these kind of, these, these properties of group deliberation? Okay, so thanks a lot for that. That's, I think that's a really great question. And it's actually something that I have also thought a lot about. And uh, uh, I mean, because when I first started thinking about these issues about responsibility and AI, that was exactly the, the way I went. I mean, I think we should think of ourselves, well, let me start, start, start over. So I think that some of the people who have discussed this issue have treated the AI systems as acting completely independently of us humans, as, as if we are over here, here's the AI, the self-driving cars or the killer robots or whatever. They act independent of us, and so we are not responsible for what they're doing, so to speak. And so my initial suggestion, which I've uh, defended uh, uh, actually, uh, well, actually in both of those uh, books that were mentioned, is exactly that we should think of this as kind of group activity. And uh, we, even if we hand over tasks to the technology, we could still play the role of a kind of supervisor or commander or manager, you know, whatever you might want to call it. And you know, in those ro roles, uh, if I'm supervising a human or maybe an AI system, I can still be responsible because I have a kind of what is sometimes called command responsibility. It's my, it's my role to, to, you know, to be responsible. But I think actually uh, that this works much better when it comes to blame than it comes to praise. And I think you were also hinting at that a little bit in some of your commentary there, uh, that, I mean, if I'm working together with another person and they are showing a lot of talent and putting in a lot of effort. Okay, maybe I'm guiding them, I'm the coach or something like that. 
still, I mean, when it comes to who gets the medal, we don't give it to the coach, we give it to the athlete who, you know, did all that hard work. And I think the same thing. I mean, if I let ChatGPT write my papers and I just kind of, you know, maybe edit it lightly and I put my name on it, still, we have a similar kind of situation where I don't really deserve a lot of, I mean, maybe I deserve a tiny bit of praise because maybe my edits, you know, did some good. But uh, so, so I think we, we still get a, a symmetry, even if we think in terms of a kind of group agent with us and AI systems. And I mean, I also agree with you that we get a lot of the same kinds of problems if we just actually put the AI aside and we just think about groups of people. And uh, I mean, actually, well, his, historically it's exaggerated, but like during the discussion of responsibility gaps of certain kinds, there have actually been two parallel discussions. People who have worried about human organizations often in business ethics and sort of military ethics and things like that are discussing possible gaps we do things together so why are you know individuals responsible and then this ai discussion and only recently have people said that actually we should put these discussions together uh, i mentioned uh, my colleague christian list for example he has a paper about this from uh, two years ago uh, where he says that there's actually a very strong overlap and uh, as i said i've also thought a little bit along those lines but yeah, so I, I think we still get the praise, blame, asymmetry. Uh, uh, I was using the individual agency case because I think it just illustrates things more clearly. But I think, you know, when you go into the details, we, we should go the way that you suggest, but we still would get the praise, blame, asymmetry because, again, it would be easier to be blameworthy in your role as a leader or supervisor or manager uh, for bad things that the people under your you know watch uh, do as opposed to taking credit for, you know, the, the hard work that they they do. Hey, great. Yeah, that's about, I, I think we're completely in agreement then. That's great. Thank you. Great, great point, both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next up is Tony Bonner. And I'll just say that after that, um, uh, Pranya, Pranya um, we'll read your question from the chat. Uh, hi. Um... So I've been wondering if AI really introduces any new moral or responsibility issues that haven't been present with technology for a long time. And I have two examples. Um, one is uh, a, a self-driving car that crashes, kills someone. How is that different from a, a car that crashes and kills someone because the brakes fail? Okay, it's still a mechanical failure, you could argue. And secondly, um, giving machines um, the ability to decide when to use lethal force. That's the issue with like killer robots. How yep. is that different from a landmine or, or, um, or a booby trap where, where no human decides when it's going to go off, but a machine based on its sensor information decides when to go off? Yeah, no, I think that's... How, how do they uh, introduce any new issues, Quali qualitatively new issues? Yeah, well, I mean, I think they're two ways you could go here. I mean, so one would just be to say that you're absolutely right, that in a certain sense, there is no difference. It's just that the AI somehow, I mean, makes this idea more vivid that, you know, as we automate things, we start using technologies and rather than doing things with our own hands, you know, ourselves, uh, we, you know, there's unclarity about, you know, how to think about responsibility. Uh, so that AI then is just a more fancy, you know, tool, so to speak. That's one way of going. Uh, I was still leaving open the question, like, you know, how should we think about responsibility in these cases? And, uh, um, you know, there will still be a kind of worry that, you know, we, the more tools we use, the, the less obvious it is how to think about responsibility. The other way of going uh, would be to say that actually the difference between AI technologies and other tools and other technologies is that uh, there is a kind of agency in the AI uh, that there isn't in a hammer or, a, you know, a, a regular car, et cetera. Uh, actually, some ways in which people, I mean, there's a, a researcher at uh, Syracuse, uh, a German guy, uh, Johannes Himmelreich, who argues that uh, we should understand the idea of responsibility gaps in terms of minimal agents. And so the AI technologies are kind of agents, they, they act in the world, but they're not moral agents like you and I are. And so they are performing morally relevant tasks without being moral agents. And this creates a kind of new type of problem. We have a new agent in the world, but it's not a ethical, responsible moral agent. And so uh, handing over ethical tasks to them is a kind of problem. So, I mean, I'm actually kind of leading a little bit in your direction that we are just kind of amplifying a problem that we may already have in other cases. But uh, either way, I think, uh, 
um, yeah, I mean, it's still very interesting and important, I think, to think about responsibility, given that people really want to blame people when bad things happen, and they really want to take credit when good things happen. And uh, whether it is the case that there's something new here or whether it's just something old that's been amplified, we still have these issues about responsibility. And I think we also have the issues that I talked about with uh, different kinds of asymmetries. So is a guided missile an agent? So you fire a missile at an aircraft, and it tracks, it locks onto its heat signature, and it hits, maybe it hits or misses, right? Because of mechanical reasons. Okay. Is it, so is a guided missile an agent? Uh, well, I mean, as it happens, this is something that I've also uh, thought a lot about and uh, quite interested in. So I, sh I should very much share your interest in these kinds of questions. It seems to me that, the, I mean, agent depends a little bit on what field you're, uh, you're in. And, you know, in, in some fields, I mean, so there's the active agent in some medicine. I mean, we talk about agency in, in that sense. And maybe if we talk about medical research, in computer science, uh, agent is maybe used as something a little bit more advanced, as something that can be. A, to which we can attribute a goal and to which uh, about which we can say that the agent is sort of responding in a kind of intelligent seeming way to its environment uh, sometimes when philosophers talk about agents they require much more that uh, there has to be thought there has to be uh, some consciousness of one's situation etc and, and nothing would be an agent if it does didn't have conscious thought about the situation it is in so i think it depends a little bit on how we define this idea of agency but i would say that a minimal at least we say that an agent is something about which we could say that it's pursuing a goal and it seems to be responding uh, to its environment in pursuing that goal. And in that sense, I think your uh, heat seeking missile would be a simple kind of agent. So my robotic vacuum cleaner, which is pretty stupid actually, would also be an agent. Absolutely, but it would be a much less sophisticated agent than, and than you are, for example. And much less sophisticated than a guided missile. <laughs> that's right so yeah so there, there's definitely a, 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 a sort of a spectrum here where may uh, maybe human beings some of us uh, uh, are sophisticated agents uh, uh, maybe uh, you know newborns are also agents but less sophisticated uh, they might might be more sophisticated than the Roomba uh, robot etc so you know we the class of agents is you know contains the more or less sophisticated members so to speak thank you Excuse me. Um, so our next question is from Pranya. I'm so, I apologize if I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name and I'm reading it from the chat uh, uh, here. So thank you for this incredibly fascinating talk, exclamation mark. Uh, this is rather a broad question, but I'm wondering about how responsibility gaps can be addressed to users in AI documentation, especially in the event of misuse. Currently, I'm finding that this side of AI ethics appears to be absent in some of the documentation websites for AI that I have visited thus far. If possible, are there any ideas you are willing to share about translating these responsibility guidelines concisely and precisely to general users of AI technologies, e.g. chat GPT? Yeah, well, uh, I think it's an important and but difficult question. I mean, most AI developers say that they want to be responsible and that they want to develop responsible AI. Uh, I mean, that phrase already uh, will, to some people's ears, be confused because the, a lot of people think that AI technologies themselves cannot be responsible. Uh, they may be agents, as we were saying uh, just a moment ago, but they are not responsible agents. And so responsible AI should be taken to mean something like uh, you know, the, I don't know, the humans uh, making the rules for the AI or acting responsibly or like the, you know, the, the laws governing the AI or selected responsibly and then assigns responsibility to different people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I mean, I think there, it's very hard to give clear and easy uh, guidelines, partly because I think there are these different kinds of asymmetries with, this, with respect to praise and blame and, you know, when are we worthy of uh, recognition for something good that happens and when uh, is it appropriate to blame or punish someone so w one thing i would recommend is that you know uh, people think about this in a differentiated kind of way that they don't think that every kind of responsibility is going to be treated the same way i mean i also talked a little bit earlier about the idea that in when we occupy certain kinds of roles 
this may involve responsibilities for what other people do, or maybe what technologies do that may be different uh, from cases where we will occupy other kinds of roles. And so I would say uh, we should really think about this issue uh, that you're raising, but it's actually quite complicated. And so we need uh, a bunch of different rules uh, applying for different kinds of contexts, uh, depending on what role one is playing in relation to some technology, depending whether the technology does something good or bad, and, and so on and so forth. So important question, but not one that to which one can give an easy, quick answer. Thank you. Um, so I'm just following up with my mic. Um, I just wanted to sort of follow up on that. And while I understand it's a complicated issue, I also feel as though with the pace of how fast um, artificial intelligence is, you know, coming into the world and um, there's this, um, kind of lack of understanding between the general public and then, um, you know, artificial intelligence companies and just getting across the fact, for example, that an artificial intelligence isn't conscious yet, but a lot of people think they do, um, they are. So maybe as a starting point, is there any kind of specific uh, you know, way of at least getting these kinds of ideas across comprehensively to someone who's um, not what, as well were first in the philosophical or um, uh, field of study of artificial intelligence. Yeah, again, a great question. I mean, uh, the, just a couple of weeks ago, there was this open letter signed by lots of uh, prominent people claiming that, you know, really the development of large language models should be slowed down and uh, research on sort of the next thing after GPT-4 should, uh, should, should be done uh, in a way, way we should just let these things out in society and just see what happens. Uh, that's irresponsible is basically the idea that uh, the people who wrote this letter had. And I mean, there, I have a, a former colleague in, in the Netherlands where I worked before I moved to, to Munich, uh, Ibo van der Poel, who says that actually a lot of technology is a kind of big social experiment. Technologies are just kind of dropped out in society and then people see what happens. And uh, that's quite different than when it comes to uh, drugs or, or you know, medical treatments where we have uh, in most countries a really uh, strict, you know, there has to be lots of trials and like you know, it's heavily regulated. You can't just drop a new medicine out in society. There should be something similar according to Van der Poel and others when it comes to AI and other technologies. Uh, I mean, I mean, Sam Altman of uh, OpenAI, he was uh, on, uh, I can't remember if it was CBS or NBC or one of his shows recently, and he himself said, yeah, there are lots of risks, uh, but they can also be turned out really well. And some people saw that uh, clip and said, well, if he himself thinks that there are lots of big risks, why is he just kind of releasing this to the general public and see, to, to see what happens? And so I guess one guideline would be to just be a little bit slower when it comes to just releasing things to the uh, general public and we should uh, proceed with much more caution. So I see we have another um, question in the chat and Charles and, and, and if you can um, uh, use your mic, I'd invite you to, to ask your question yourself. And if not, I will ask it for you. I can, I can certainly do that. It was just a general musing, actually, as I'm listening to the conversation, I found the presentation fascinating. And uh, I was just sort of piggybacking on this idea about the robot vacuum. And if the vacuum on that, if the vacuum, uh, uh, if you choose to use the robot vacuum and it catches fire and burns down your apartment, doesn't the fact that you chose to assign, you, you chose to use that device, assign the responsibility to you because you haven't made sure that that tool is safe. Now, piggybacking on that as well, again, I was musing, I haven't quite hit, uh, hit my message yet. Oh, and you've gone uh, mute again. I think you hit your mute button, Parthas. Oh, sorry. Um, I beg your pardon. I, I, and sort of piggybacking on the idea about sort of, you know, responsibility, um, there is AI being used to determine the viability of fertilized uh, human embryos uh, for A IVF, and the success rate is, is, is quite promising. But if, um, if a, um, a, a couple decide to use that AI on the advice of their doctor, 
and um, uh, and the the AI picks up, you know, this particular number uh, embryo is the best one, and that that embryo gets uh, implanted, and everything else uh, gets destroyed. Uh, and if it's later found that that embryo has a genetic defect uh, or something that is wrong, doesn't the AI software company have some responsibility for the integrity of their product, particularly when money is being is changing hands? So there's a product to service that. Uh, so there is a, a commercial a commercial transaction taking place. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. I think that's really. Uh, good point as well. I, mean, I think uh, one factor that one has to take into account is does the companies or, or, or the person with the vacuum cleaner, do they keep coming back to using these technologies again and again? So, so let's say that the, you know, the person buys the, the vacuum cleaner to, to use your first example, it catches fire completely uh, sort of you know, unexpectedly. And the person says, okay, well, I didn't see that coming. I'm never going to use a robotic vacuum cleaner again. I'm always just going to you know, use a regular vacuum cleaner and so that I can turn it off as soon as something bad happens. Well, maybe that person actually is dealing with this in a very responsible way. Maybe they shouldn't be blamed for the fire. And they responded by saying, okay, from now on, I'm just going to not use a robotic vacuum cleaner versus let's say that the person, okay, well, caught fire. And then they try it again, and it, let's say it catches fire one more time, and they're like, "Yeah, okay, it wasn't my fault." And then they go on, and you know there are lots of fires that are being caused by this robotic vacuum cleaner. The fact that they keep using this thing, uh, despite knowing what the risks are, I think makes the person more responsible for these unintended but uh, foreseen outcomes. In the same way, uh, maybe in this in the other example, if if this happens once and then they decide, okay, never again, are we going to use this AI technology in this IVF uh, case? Then maybe again, that might be a responsible way of responding to this. But if they say, okay, well, that's that's fine, let's keep doing it, then maybe this will over time make them more responsible for any bad outcomes that may occur and that they now know can occur, uh, so to speak. So I think it depends a little bit on. You know, is this a one-time thing and then you know they decide to go back to the drawing board and, and you know redo the technology or do they, do they keep using the technology again foreseeing that these things might, might that might they might allow these bad outcomes to happen so the time factor should be also put in there i think is part of the the way to respond to that i have some comments on that but i'll save them for afterwards perhaps i see T tony um bonner has his hand up again and i'll i'll, I'll pass the floor to him Thanks. I'm sorry, I can't uh, turn my video on. My monitor hasn't got a webcam. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I was quite interested in the comment on this recent uh, letter to pause research in um, in AI, and I've I've also heard um, in, in you know in various other places um, arguments against it, and the two of the arguments are are the, one of the so uh, it's very it's arrogant and naive to think we can possibly imagine the future out the future uh, outcomes of uh, positive and negative outcomes of AI. Uh, you just have to wait until it happens. Um, the internet is a prime example. You know, in the 1980s, scientists were developing the internet. Ten years became before it burst on the world scene. You could never have imagined then what what what's, what has been done now that online retailing, online dating. You just could never imagine. You just had to wait until it happens and then and deal with it. And the the other um, <clears throat> the other argument I've heard is that uh, we may pause, we could pause our AI development, but um, um, other regimes that don't have our best interests at heart, and I'm thinking China and Russia, won't. Okay, and uh, we don't want them to uh, get a military advantage or an advantage of any kind over us in that way. So those are those. those, those how do you respond to those two arguments? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, pausing research is usually not a good idea. I think, I mean, actually, I, I read uh, uh, an interview with one of the people who signed that letter who said something that I think makes sense. I mean, they, they also thought that it's not realistic to think that the, the, the research can be paused, but still it could be you know worth making a statement seeing that things are going a little bit too fast and uncontrolled and you know let's not just release these things out into the public just like just like that without really thinking about what 
we're doing. So there could be a kind of symbolic value of saying like, okay, let's, let's you know, slow down a little bit. Uh, and, uh, but to the first point you're making, like if it's really the case that we really can't predict what, what good will come out of this or what bad will come out of this. I and mean, that's another reason to really, you know, to proceed with caution and try to put a lot of sort of precautionary measures uh, in, into, you know, out there so that we're not just putting the technology just to see what happens, but, you know, to do that in a way that we also think about, okay, well, how can we deal with these different scenarios that are hard to predict? Uh, yeah, uh, which again, doesn't say, okay, let's stop the research, but just you know, let's, be, let's be very careful. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that, uh, uh, you know, OpenAI wasn't very careful when they released chat DPT the way that they did. Uh, now, with the second point, I mean, yeah, that's, that's uh, I mean, I think here too, you can go different ways. I mean, so if, if you say, okay, you know, the other side are gonna do bad things, so let's also do bad things. I mean, that's not a great argument, but on the other hand, uh, I think that's not what you meant to say is rather this, uh, or, or you know, you you were um, meant referring to an argument that you had heard. If the idea is that, yeah, I mean, we want we want to make sure that we're on top of things so that you know we we know what what could come from sort of other actors. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good uh, argument and an important one. It's still compatible with the idea that we should really proceed with caution and we should put lots of sort of precautionary measures in in, in place so that uh, when the unforeseen bad things happened, we at least have some sort of plan for how to respond to it, you know, whether we will be successful or not, that's, that's another issue. So, so proceed with more caution is my general. So would uh, you have applied that same logic to say the um, development, uh, development, you know, 80 years ago of antibiotics? Don't, don't proceed with caution because we don't know what ant if antibiotics are really going to be bad or good. Yeah, but well, I mean, antibiotics, that, that, I mean, that, that is an interesting, interesting case, given how people are very much resistant to a lot of, that's right. uh, well, that's right. That's right. yeah, so well, that's, it, 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 it took many, it took many decades for that to show up. Indeed, yeah, I mean, absolutely, I mean, I think that's another really great and difficult case, and to know, you know, how should we have navigated that, I mean, I, I don't know, it's really good, uh, the case, indeed. How about the introduction of the printing press? Yeah, I mean, I, I, people have said that the printing press gave wings to truth, but gave double wings to untruth. Yeah, Just yeah. Like I mean, I, I think you're pointing to a very common fact about most technologies is that they t tend to be double-edged swords. They have good sides and bad sides. Uh, I think it still makes sense to say that you know we should we should think about these things not only afterwards. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that that's what you're suggesting, but uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have criticized again some of the tech companies for this, you know, move fast, break things. So whatever, whatever the slogan is, uh, mentality has, I think, led to some bad outcomes that could have been at least mitigated to some extent. Yeah, and and I think Sven, I will give you the last the last word there on on that. I, I'm afraid that we're just about out of time. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, I especially thank our speakers, Sven Nijmholm, for what such a fascinating and provocative talk, and to all of the audience for for asking such uh, provocative questions and and uh, and encouraging a really fascinating discussion. I think these are, you know, these these showcase why we have philosophy. There are many ethical issues that that don't have clear. Uh, right, wrong answers to them, and and these are this is what we ponder, especially as we consider building AI systems that are systematizing some of these decisions that that we're we're making for what's good and what's bad. So, uh, please join me in in thanking Sven again for for his fascinating talk, and to those of you I will who are regulars with the SRI seminar series, I will remind you that this is unfortunately our last seminar of the season, and uh, but we will be beginning the season again in September of twenty. 2023 and we look forward to seeing you all then so thank you Sven and thanks to to everyone who has participated this year thank you thank you very much